have a DOD personnel in Ukraine now? So I see Francois is here. You are the second speaker. And I see Bertus is here. You're the first speaker. I'm going to make it so that you can share your screen. Bertus, if you want to share your screen now and uh, test everything, you can go ahead. Uh, okay. And Kim Boldis, our third speaker, I do not see yet, but at least we have our first two. So, Bertus, unless you object, this uh, session is going to be, uh, your talk will be recorded and live streamed to YouTube. Okay. And we'll start in, give me two minutes. I gotta make a two minute run. Okay. Okay, uh, let us uh, start on time. And uh, the first speaker is uh, Bertus von Heerden. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And uh, at the University of Pretoria, the Department of Physics, and is going to talk us about light harvesting complex two. Bertus, uh, I see you are sharing your screen already, so please start. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, okay, that's just telling me it was recording. Um, so, um, yes, my talk is about real time feedback driven single particle tracking spectroscopy of LHC2. Um, 
So photosynthesis is the most important biological process, uh, in my opinion, because it is the source of energy for almost all of life. Uh, in plants, uh, the process starts in the photosystems, uh, and uh, this is where light is absorbed and where the first chemical reactions take place. And the photosystem consists of the core, uh, as well as the light harvesting complexes, uh, which are uh, responsible for absorbing most of the light. And in plants, the main light harvesting complex is called light harvesting complex 2, uh, or LHC2. Um, so LHC2 has a few interesting properties. Uh, it, it, it functions to absorb photons and then transfer that energy along to the reaction center. And under the right conditions, it can do this with almost 100% quantum efficiency. Um, it is also able to regulate the energy transfer um, in a process called non-photochemical quenching. And this is a very important process uh, that prevents photo damage from excess energy being absorbed. So because these proteins are very photoactive, they are easily studied using fluorescence. Uh, for example, we can look at the brightness or the lifetime or the spectrum of the fluorescence. And most experiments using fluorescence use a very large number of individual uh, complexes, either in a live plant or in a uh, in a solution of a lot of, of proteins. So what happens when we zoom in and look at a single light harvesting complex and look at its fluorescence? We do this using a technique called single molecule spectroscopy, and this unveils some very interesting dynamics. We see that there is heterogeneous and unsynchronized dynamics across different complexes. So from one complex to the next, you can see all kinds of different things that, are, that they are not synchronized. And this means that these dynamics are basically completely hidden on an ensemble level. For example, here I show the spectral time traces of, of three different complexes, and they are kind of switching between these different spectrums. And But if you look at a macroscopic sample, you will just see the average of these different spectra that are actually being switched between. Um, so how do we measure a single complex? Uh, we typically use uh, what's called a laser confocal microscope. So we have an incoming laser beam in yellow, and, and this is then focused by a high power objective onto our sample. And this excites the fluorescence of, and we, we dilute the sample so that we only get one complex at a time in the laser beam. Uh, and then the sample fluoresces, and this is shown in red, that fluorescence is picked up by the same objective and then focused through a dichroic beam splitter, which just separates the fluorescence based on wavelength. Uh, and it's focused on a confocal pinhole, and that confocal pinhole is functions to reject out of focus light that is mostly background. So that would be represented by green and blue. So everything that's out of focus that is not a complex is ideally blocked by the pinhole, and then after that we just have a very sensitive detector. Um, so what can we measure in this way? Well, from a single complex, you can actually get a lot of information. We can measure the brightness of the fluorescence. We can measure the lifetime of the fluorescence. And we can also measure the spectrum. And you can even measure things like ultra-fast time resolved dynamics or photon correlations that can tell you lots of interesting information and many other things that you can, that you can measure. Uh, so SMS is a very powerful technique. However, it does have a big limitation. And that is, it is a very unnatural, it takes place in a very unnatural environment. Uh, we have to use isolated complexes that are completely removed from the natural environment. Uh, they have to be highly diluted in solution. Uh, they have to be attached to a surface such as a cover slip. Um, and we have to use very high light intensities. 
much higher than this complex or C when it's actually doing photosynthesis, even in full sunlight. Um, so this limits, this kind of unnatural environment limits the, the amount of uh, physiologically relevant information we can get uh, using SMS. Um, now, a technique that can solve at least one of these issues, namely the surface attachment, um, is called real-time feedback-driven single particle tracking, or RTFT SPT for short. Now, this is a technique that uses feedback control to keep a particle in the observation volume. And this particle will be, otherwise would just be really diffusing in solution. And um, it is able to track individual particles in real time. Uh, and this is not to be confused with traditional image-based SPT. So an image-based SPT and series of images are captured using a camera. And then afterwards you link to documents. Whereas uh, RTFB HPT uses a real time feedback loop that follows an individual particle one at a time. It has a number of advantages over uh, conventional SMS. Uh, firstly, there's no need for immobilization, so the particle is freely, freely diffusing while you do these measurements. And therefore, you can even do this technique in vivo uh, with the right sample. And, and another advantage is that you also get the fusion information uh, from, the, from the tracking. And this can, for example, tell you how big the particle is, which you cannot do with conventional SMS. Uh, it also has some advantages over the conventional image space SPT. Uh, firstly, it has an improved time resolution, which can be below a millisecond even, because you don't have to scan, uh, capture a whole frame using a camera. Um, and it also has an improved axial tracking range. So a camera can typically just look at a 2D slice, whereas with real-time tracking, you can actually track in the depth direction as well, up to tens of micron. There is a disadvantage in, in RTFT SPT also, which is a very high complexity and a high and so there are many different approaches to uh, real-time feedback driven uh, tracking. And the, 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 at the core of all the techniques is, uh, is or, or the main difference between the techniques is during the position. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to focus on techniques that use a scanning of the laser beam to measure the, the position. And the idea is that you scan the beam in some where a uh, pattern in time and then looking at the time uh, resolved or the 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 fluorescence uh, over time you can extract the position and three methods that i looked at is uh, the, or that we'll look at is the orbital method which scans the beam in a circle around the particle the night steer method which uses a grid but scans in this kind of night steer pattern to evenly illuminate the whole grid over time. And Minflux, which uses a donut beam with a zero intensity in the middle, um, is, a, is another technique that has specific advantages. So the question is, which real-time tracking method is the best? And when you look at experimental results, it's actually very difficult to, to say. And because it's difficult to compare them, uh, sample per, across different labs. And therefore, we thought it would be good to develop a theoretical framework to, do, to investigate different methods. And we use this to compare different scanning patterns, as well as to compare uh, using fluorescent versus using a scattering based technique called eye scan. And this talk, I don't have time to really go into the ISCAT, but I just wanted to mention that we did this as well. Uh, and in this theoretical comparison, we had two strategies. Uh, firstly, we looked at the statistics of localizing a static particle. And secondly, we uh, developed a dynamical simulation that simulated the entire tracking process. So in terms of the static localization, we use something called the Kramer-Rao bound, which is a 
a mathematical way of calculating the, the lower bound on the precision with which a method can localize a particle. And what I've plotted in this uh, graph is the, the, the basically the, the precision, uh, technically it's the kramer bound, each method as a function of the particle position relative to the center of the tracking area. And what you can see is Minflux in orange has a very, very good precision in the center. Um, so a very low uh, error in, in, in position in, in center, but it has a very bad precision at the edges. Uh, the night steward, uh, and, and the other thing about Minflux is if you look at the green one, this is where Minflux has a scanning area that is as big as the orbital matrix, whereas for the orange, Minflux has a very small scanning. So Minflux is very good when you scan a very small area using it, but it's not good when you try to scan a large area using this donut B. And the night steward in blue has a very, very even uh, tracking uh, uh, precision and it has precision at the edges of the scan. Um, and the, the orbital method in red is kind of something in between uh, the night steward and the flux in that regard. Um, so to do the dynamic simulation, the idea is that we simulate the tracking uh, setup. So you have the laser position that is varied over time. This then is compared, uh, this based on where the particle is in the laser that uh, determines how much fluorescence there is. So this is simulated, noise is added. Uh, from there, a measured position is calculated uh, using the, the, uh, the, the laser position. And, and the intent, I mean, from the fluorescence intensity, you calculate the position. This is fed into a simulated control system as well as a simulation of a microscope which is the actual output that is used to track the particle. And this thing is then also, uh, the no other thing that is also simulated is the particle diffusion. So all, the, all of this is simulated in time. And if you do a one run of the simulation, result like this. Uh, so this is a, two examples of tracking runs. On the left, you have a tracking run with a low diffusion coefficient, so slow diffusion, and on the right you have really fast diffusion. And what we've shown is in the in gray with the, the that is the position of the particle in the x and y axis, and in red we have the stage. So you can see on the left with slow diffusion, the stage is very nicely tracking the particle, it follows the particle position, whereas with fast diffusion, the stage is keeping up, and it it loses the particle here and there, and then at the end, it, it completely loses it, and the particle diffuses away, and the stage cannot track it anymore. And so what we can do is for each of these runs, we can calculate the average tracking error, and um, uh, also for each thing, and that's for each run, and um, that's called E, doesn't really matter what you call it, but um, what we can then do is we can plot this average tracking error as a function of the diffusion coefficient. So for D, we do a bunch of different runs and then you get the average tracking error. And here we plotted this for the different methods. And so the general trend that you can see for all of these curves is that for really fast diffusion, what you see is this sharp jump where the particle becomes uh, untrackable essentially. So uh, above this this big jump, it cannot be tracked, whereas below the jump, it is. And in the middle, you see this kind of behavior that I've shown here, where it's tracked a little bit and then gets lost. Um, for the medium values of the diffusion coefficient, we see good tracking, uh, where the, the stage closely follows the particle. And then for, for really, really slow diffusion, um, you, you basically start tracking noise. Uh, but as you can see in the, um, the larger scale uh, uh, graph that I showed in the bottom left here, even though if you zoom in, it doesn't look like we're tracking. If, if you zoom out, you see actually this particle is basically stationary um, anyway. So um, comparing the different methods, 
what we see is that the live steward in yellow has the highest cutoff, so it is able to track the fastest particles, uh, whereas Minflux in the track kind of medium tracking, it has the best precision, so it has a very low error in, in tracking area. Uh, however, Minflux does have a very low cutoff, so it cannot track fast particles. And the orbital method, as in the case of the static um, result, is, is in the middle. It has a kind of in the middle regarding precision, but also regarding speed. And as a reference, because what we eventually want to track using this method is uh, or is going to be LAC2, uh, as, I, as I'm talking about later in the talk, um, I show the diffusion coefficient of LAC2 in a natural membrane, as well as just in water solution. So on to the experiment. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through the experimental setup. Uh, we have a laser source that is just filtered and whatnot uh, to, to clean it up. That is deflected by a tip top mirror in X and Y direction. Uh, it's sent into our microscope where we have a dichroic and an objective, sending it into the, the sample. The fluorescence is collected by the same objective, it goes through a fluorescence filter, uh, through the confocal panel into our detect detection box. Uh, where we have a single photon avalanche diode, which measures lifetimes and intensity, and then also a, a spectrograph that consists of a grating and uh, uh, a very sensitive CCD camera. Uh, and this is all controlled by a PC, which houses a FPGA card, which is a really, really fast um, controller. That is that operates the tracking controller as well as a TCSPC card, which is what we use to measure fluorescence lifetimes. And we applied this experiment to uh, LHC2. So we used the isolated LHC2 complexes uh, in a detergent buffer uh, that was diluted to a very, very low concentration, sub molar. And to this, we added 20% which is something that just increases the viscosity of the solution uh, to make the diffusion slower. And we use the orbital tracking method um, at a 300 hertz frequency. Uh, the reason we use the orbital method is that uh, besides having a balance of precision and speed, it is also um, a lot cheaper than the other two methods that kind of push the extremes on either end of the tracking and precision trade-off. Um, and so here I show the, the results. So um, we, we measure the intensity and, and track the particle, uh, or this is a, an example of a tracking run. So you can see that um, the, 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 the particle diffuses relatively quickly, uh, and it actually the, the state tracks the particle until the end of the of its tracking range. So when it gets to minus 100 there in the X, that's that's the end of where it can, can go. And um, there is a lot of intensity variation, and this might be to inherent uh, fluctuations in intensity that we also see with um, uh, immobilized particles that we call fluorescence blinking. Uh, and it could also be because we use a two-dimensional tracking in a thin kind of sandwich of uh, of liquid, but uh, there is a little bit of axial movement that can, can also contribute to this uh, intensity fluctuations. Nevertheless, we were able for this particle to measure um, fluorescence lifetime decay, as well as a fluorescent spectral price. And this, uh, these decays are, uh, 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 are they expected with both the fluorescence lifetime of three nanoseconds and the, the spectrum that you can see here are comparable to um, other SMS, traditional SMS results on LXC2. So we know that this is uh, really LXC2 that, that we tracked and we could, could do a nice spectral and lifetime measurement. And so in the future, uh, we, we want to um, we have some future improvements planned, uh, and the first is to do faster tracking using a night steward. 
Um, we also want to extend our tracking to 3D to eliminate some of that axial um, fluctuations and also um, to, to have more applications that we can, can, can go for. We are thinking about using this technique called interferometric scattering uh, or iSCAT, which is a scattering-based technique, which we think will maybe work better than fluorescence for the tracking at least. Um, and then we also have some ideas about uh, doing experiments in a membrane environment to get an even more uh, natural kind of environment for the protein. And then we also have some interesting ideas relating to single molecule plasmonics. And if you're interested about plasmonics, it, it is a very interesting topic with SMS and light harvesting. You can look at this paper that I cited here. Um, so in summary, uh, Real-time feedback-driven single-particle tracking enables high-speed, high-resolution tracking of nanoparticles with simultaneous spectroscopic measurements. Different methods have different strengths and drawbacks, uh, and there is a fundamental trade-off between speed and precision. And we apply this technique to measure spectra and lifetimes of freely diffusing LHC2 uh, proteins. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, my supervisor, Professor Claude Clear, as well as the other conference organizers. And then for funding, I, I thank the NRF, uh, Nithix, uh, the rental pool program from the NLC and of South Africa, and then also the South African Academy of Science and Art. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for a very nice talk. Are there any questions? You can either unmute yourself and ask away or uh, use the raise your hand function that's down on the bottom line. Bottom. That I, sometimes I cannot even find myself. So uh, I have I just <clears throat> maybe just one question. Um, you were funding. You have a funding of a national the South African Academy of Science and Art, and I want to focus on the art part. What what is what is the art sort of application of uh, of your work? <laughs> hmm. Um. Well, I, I think that um, this 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 technique uh, of real time tracking is is a mic microscopy uh, technique fundamentally, um, and I think that that microscopy can sometimes be uh, create very nice art. Um, specifically for real time tracking, I've not seen that many nice things. I think that there was uh, earlier in the in the um, the talk, there was a nice, probably right at the beginning, that this is the best figure anyone has ever made, I know of. And mm -hmm. um, it's not that arty, but but maybe someone can eventually think of, because if, if you think about something like super resolution microscopy, uh, some people make really, really beautiful things. And I've actually been to an art museum where, um, I don't know if you know about this, but they, the, the, um, I was once in Stellenbosch at an art museum and they had some uh some art i think it was mainly um uh ben lewis uh, at stanamos university who does a lot of super resolution microscopy was was involved with like doing a so so maybe rtfd spiti can also at some point contribute some some really beautiful images mm -hmm. is there any other questions i had one another but uh, let me give there's a question. Oh, just a just a comment in the in the chat. Um, <clears throat> I guess a uh, uh, one application that I would think of that seems seems interesting is if you could um, do a study of the same molecule under different conditions, different uh, say buffer conditions or of uh, uh, field field direction, a field magnitude. Um, I and mean, I'm thinking of uh, situations where you could like uh, whatever like a chameleon uses to change colors or um, hmm. 
or um, I guess there are beetles that do that too. Um, or um, I don't know, any, any optically driven biological response. Yeah, I mean, this is this is definitely something that um, that that is already something we look at using SMS uh, in light of us in complexes because they and um, and for example this this non photochemical quenching which is a uh, which which is a process that happens inside of LHQ, um but is controlled by the environment so it's mm -hmm. certainly and and part of that is the 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 light so. Um, there are interesting uh, results. I'm sure you know that of some of those um, because uh, Prof. Pierre has, has published many papers and, uh, and a few of them focused on the, the effect of light uh, in controlling this process inside of LHQ. Right, and photodynamic drugs and a bunch of other Yes, there are many, many other things that, that could be very, yeah. very interesting down. Yeah. Are there any other questions for the speaker? <clears throat> if not, let's uh, give them a round of applause. You can, oh, there's the raise your hand thing. Uh, we can give them a clap. Or, uh, Thank you. Let's throw them a couple of flowers, do some hearts. Okay, let's uh, move to the second speaker, who is uh, Francois, Francois Conradi. Did I pronounce that correctly? I think you uh, can he, share your screen. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, uh, yes, so it looks like my um, Zoom is malfunctioning, but... Um, I'll try to uh, share my screen um, and see if it works. Um, okay, can you uh, see uh, my screen? Yes. All right, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, Hold on one yes. second, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, well, no, no, I'm gonna do. I was going to start and stop the recording, but I think um, just because it makes it easier to chop up, but I think I'll, I'll not do that. Go ahead. All right. All right. Um, I hope it's still working. Um, yeah, it's just yeah. a bit slow. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, I, um, yeah, my name is Francois Conradi, and I'm a master's student in physics at the University of Pretoria. In this presentation, uh, I will talk about experimental uh, results obtained recently uh, using fluorescence correlation spectroscopy uh, in conjunction with uh, time-correlated single, single photon counting in studying the aggregation of Light Harvesting Complex 2 or LHC2. Um, I will also uh, talk about a bit about photosynthesis in plants, uh, which occur inside uh, chloroplasts, um, wherein sunlight is absorbed in the thylakoid membranes by chlorophyll containing uh, um, protein complexes. The absorption of sunlight initiates uh, the process of light harvesting in uh, the supercomplex photosystem 2, uh, which is shown here. A top view is um, also visible, uh, which allows for distinguishing the different light harvesting complexes in its composition. LHG2 is, um, is the most important uh, of these light harvesting complexes. It absorbs uh, photons from the sun and transfers um, the energy with almost 100% efficiency to a photosynthetic uh, reaction center uh, labeled C. Other than the uh, incredibly efficient um, energy transfer, photosystem 2 also exhibits unusual uh, mechanisms of protection um, against photo damage 
due to the overabsorption of light. Uh, this is known as uh, non photochemical quenching or MPQ, which uh, involves several uh, quenching uh, rate components at different time scales. The fastest component, uh, dubbed QE, uh, is responsible for most of MPQ and is activated actually by an uh, increased uh, pH gradient over the thylakoid membrane. The presence of LHC2 and uh, this pH gradient are uh, required for the activation of this quenching component. An increased uh, pH gradient uh, typically follows the acidification on the inner side of the thylakoid. Uh, this promotes the aggregation of LHC2, um, as has been shown uh, in vitro, and it also enhances um, the fast component of NPQ. Um, so the, the sizes of these LHC2 aggregates have only been unveiled um, in vitro recently by applying uh, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy or FCS. FCS involves the measuring of autocorrelation in the fluctuations of fluorescence emitted by uh, freely diffusing um, fluorescent molecules and fitting uh, models to the obtained autocorrelation curves. Here, such a model is uh, shown, which describes um, the effects of 3D Brownian motion on the autocorrelation curves. From this model, a uh, diffusion coefficient can be obtained, and from this, the um, average hydrodynamic uh, radius of the molecules. Uh, if the fluorescence lifetimes of these uh, molecules can be measured simultaneously, uh, then the connection between the sizes of the molecules and the corresponding uh, fluorescence decay kinetics due to quenching can be uh, parameterized directly. To uh, perform FCS on LHC2 aggregates, the following uh, experimental setup was adapted from a single molecule spectroscopy or SMS uh, setup. A supercontinuum uh, pulsing laser was used as the excitation uh, light source by filtering uh, its beam with the line filter at position one here. Um, at 633 nanometers wavelength. And then a line, it was aligned into a, a confocal uh, microscope. A single photon avalanche uh, diode was used as a detector with an instrument uh, response function of uh, 350 picoseconds. Um, the only changes made to adapt the setup from SMS uh, was to install a water immersion objective at position four and a confocal panel um, in front of the detection box at position nine uh, of 75 microns. The pulsing laser allows for uh, time correlated single photon counting or TCSPC uh, from which both fluorescence correlation autocorrelations, as well as uh, fluorescence delay times, um, could be obtained. Before a diffusion analysis could be done on the autocorrelation data, the dimensions of the effective detection volume uh, to be determined, uh, which is shown by this equation. Uh, Two-dimensional uh, roster scanning of point spread functions of individual fluorescent microspheres uh, was performed to measure the perpendicular radius of the beam's focus, um, which is the microscope resolution. After this, uh, two methods were implemented um, to find the radius of focus uh, in, in the axis of the beam 
expressed in terms of the eccentricity of the um, effective detection volume. Um, measuring the microscope resolution uh, produced the following results. Normal distribution, um, normal Gaussian distribution fitting to the spread in intensity in both the X and Y axes um, were done to, um, to determine the Gaussian beam waste radius. Uh, the data selection of the smallest point spread functions resulted in an average radius um, of 0 0.42 microns. Hereafter, a fluorescent dye with a known diffusion coefficient, namely um, ATO 647N, was prepared at uh, several um, uh, different concentrations and excited by the laser at its uh, saturation intensity for um, five minutes intervals. Fluorescence uh, photon arrival times were recorded and used to calculate um, autocorrelation curves. A compound FCS model of both 3D Brownian motion and triplet state decay uh, was fitted to the um, obtained autocorrelation curves. As a commonly practiced FCS calibration technique, this method produced a close to 15% uncertainty in the measured eccentricity at a value of 5.9. Uh, to evaluate this value, a second method was executed involving the recording of three dimensional point spread functions of fluorescent microspheres. Normal distributions were fitted to the spread in intensity along the laser beam's path to extract, uh, extract the z-axis uh, focal radius directly, which is analogous to measuring the Rayleigh length. This method produced a 10% uncertainty uh, in, in the volume's eccentricity uh, around a value of uh, 5.4. Uh, after this, LHC2 was prepared at a sub nanomolar concentration in aqueous buffer at pH 7.5 and 5.5 uh, to, to investigate the influence of acidity in its aggregation. For samples of uh, disaggregated LHC2 trimers, Alpha DM uh, detergent uh, was kept at a concentration above its uh, critical micelle concentration, which is um, 150 mic micromolar. Uh, for the formation of LHC2 aggregates, a sample was prepared with a low detergent concentration well under the CMC. These were used for control measurements to perform uh, diffusion analysis on and to find the uh, triplet lifetimes using FCS. Uh, with the uh, um, designated effective detection volume parameters obtained earlier, uh, FCS was performed with 15 minute long fluorescence intensity measurements at room temperature. The exc excitation intensity used was the same as for the previous uh, dye measurements. Um, the same uh, compound FCS model was, uh, as used earlier was uh, used to fit to the autocorrelation curves calculated from these uh, LHC2 measurements. Uh, evidently, the radii calculated um, from the diffusion times uh, are similar for both low and high detergent concentration at uh, pH 7.5. The larger fitting error for the low detergent concentration um, here shows that there's a greater range of particle radii in the solution, meaning that some aggregates do form at uh, 30 micromolar detergent concentration. The triplet lifetime of LHC2 is uh, shorter 
at low detergent concentration, indicating a higher rate of triplet state decay. After this, um, um, it was necessary to validate the, uh, the sizes obtained um, previously. So preparation of LHC2 aggregates had to be improved uh, to explore the, um, the natural limits of in-membrane aggregates. Uh, solutions of LHC2 with alpha-DM at high concentration, um, and then um, the, these were prepared and then uh, adsorbent called biobeads were added to the solution to um, remove the detergent. These fluorescence uh, quenching measurements show the um, advantage of gradually removing the detergent using an adsorbent. Um, the blue graph shows the fluorescence of LHC2 after um, biobeads were added, and the orange line for a sample um, prepared at a low detergent concentration uh, from the start. <clears throat> the quenching for a sample with low detergent concentration was uh, very sudden for the first few minutes after adding the LHC2, um, which indicates a, a chaotic aggregation process. The more uh, linear decrease over time in fluorescence after an adsorbent uh, was added indicates that almost a steady state um, process of aggregation occurred um, in the whole sample. Furthermore, uh, detergent is removed uh, very effectively by the biobeads so that even uh, more quenching occurs in total, even in a pH 7.5 buffer. Um, the, um, and well, next, uh, pH 7.5 and 7.5 solutions of LHC2 with high detergent concentration uh, were subjected to the biobeads, and then 10 microliter samples were extracted from the solutions at uh, 15 minute intervals. Fluorescence photon arrival times were recorded um, over 10 minute periods for each 10 microliter sample. Uh, the, the resultant autocorrelation curves from the first extracted sample and from the last sample extracted after 60 minutes uh, are shown here. A fitting with the compound model uh, labeled 3D plus T showed that uh, diffusion times are markedly different, indicating larger aggregates have formed after 60 minutes. The, the triplet lifetimes well, it's only resolved uh, for the 15 minute extraction, but not for the large aggregates, which can be inferred from the uh, unusually long triplet lifetime uh, found by the FIT. To evaluate the diffusion time obtained by the FIT, um, a two component uh, Brownian motion model um, was used separately. Fitting with this uh, two-component model uh, resolves the diffusion times of the two most uh, dominant species uh, in the sample. It can be noted that the second uh, diffusion times uh, obtained for, for this fit um, is similar to the diffusion time obtained using the compound model. Um, for a pH 5.5 solution subjected to biobeads uh, adsorbent, the results were uh, quite different in many ways. Triplet lifetimes were not resolvable um, for any, um, any extracted sample. Moreover, the 3D plus T compound model did not produce a sufficient fit um, for the large aggregates. Only a 3D plus 3D diffusion model worked, indicating a um, significant sample heterogeneity. The longer diffusion time obtained using this fit uh, was used to calculate uh, 
radii of aggregates. The calculated hydrodynamic radii for both uh, pH 7.5 and 5.5 are shown here in nanometers. Evidently, uh, very large aggregates form uh, suddenly uh, after 45 minutes of detergent removal. During the first uh, 45 minutes, though, the sizes of the particles um, seem to be less than the threshold between disaggregated and aggregated LHC2. Aggregate uh, radii in the samples after uh, 60 minutes of detergent removal are, uh, however, um, not within the physiological in membrane range for LHC2 aggregates. Further studies are required to, um, to understand why there's an abrupt, abrupt increase in the aggregate size um, after some period of detergent removal. To um, evaluate uh, these results, um, an alternative method of FCS was attempted as made available in the Nature Commun Communications article by um, Cezani et al. Uh, this alternative method does not involve the calculation of autocorrelation curves, but um, the direct analysis of fluorescence intensity fluctuations via a molecular dynamics model. The uh, positions of molecules traversing the effective detection volume are predicted um, in terms of diffusion coefficients by using posterior gamma distributions which are iteratively updated according to Bayesian st statistics. As obtained, after um, 100,000 updating iterations, the resultant posterior distribution of diffusion coefficients for only two seconds of measurement time for LHC2 aggregates um, is shown here. Uh, for a pH 7.5 sample, after 60 minutes of detergent removal, the, the following average diffusion coefficients were obtained from similar after 100,000 alterations each. These are uh, preliminary results, and the standard deviations of, of the distributions are still large, but a slight downward trend in diffusion coefficients can be seen indicating that aggregation continues after the sample was extracted from the adsorbent containing solution. A similar trend uh, for pH 5.5 sample can be seen here, um, but the diffusion coefficients are much smaller owing to larger uh, particle sizes. The standard deviations of some of the data points are much smaller indicating that only one aggregate was in the detection volume during uh, res the respective uh, two-second intervals of measurement time, which were analyzed. In general, the hydrodynamic radii obtained uh, from, uh, from this analysis are much larger or somewhat larger than those obtained via curve fitting. These results uh, demonstrate, however, that the time resolved uh, diffusion analysis is possible via this alternative um, method of FCS. The TCSPC data used for FCS was also anal analyzed to obtain uh, fluorescence um, decays of the extracted LHC2 samples. What was apparent immediately is the difference between fluorescence decays of um, samples extracted after 15 minutes of detergent, detergent removal and those extracted after 60 minutes. A clear uh, negative decay component can be seen for the 15-minute uh, extraction, which are um, small aggregates, um, which is absent for the, the large aggregates. Um, analysis of this required uh, fitting with multi-component exponential functions, 
um, which included both positive and negative amplitudes, which aren't uh, normalized. This was done using a simulated uh, instrument response function. Here are uh, fitting results uh, for extracted samples from a, a PS7.5 solution. Uh, before 60 minutes of detergent removal, uh, there are two lifetime components. First component uh, have uh, negative amplitudes, um, as can see, be seen in this column, indicating that uh, indeed a, a delay existed before fluorescence occurred. This was possibly caused by a Fuster resonance energy transfer or a threat, as indicated by other TCSPC studies of um, protein conformation changes. Uh, the first component also shortens um, over detergent removal time, indicating a higher rate of energy transfer as less de uh, detergent is in the solution. The average fluorescence lifetime uh, also drops very sharply between uh, the 45 minutes and 60 minutes um, of detergent removal time. Uh, for a, a pH 5.5 solution, uh, similar uh, results were obtained, although the decrease in the first lifetime component uh, was sharper. Uh, to a lesser extent, this was the case for the average fluorescence lifetimes as well. It is thus apparent that a, a lower pH, um, which ensures uh, greater rates of protonation in the um, LHC2 proteins causes the rates of uh, threat and the rates of quenching um, to increase. Further studies are uh, required to ascertain why significant threat only occurs uh, for small aggregates or trimers before large aggregates um, have formed. Uh, in conclusion, um, the LHC2 aggregate sizes and aggregate uh, triplet lifetimes can be determined uh, using FCS as, um, uh, as can be um, done on TCSPC data. Time resolved uh, diffusion analysis is also possible using a Bayesian statistical model of FCS. And uh, all this can be done simultaneously with multi-component fluorescence lifetime measurements uh, showing threat type effects on the fluorescence decay kinetics apparent during uh, detergent uh, removal um, in small LHC2 aggregates. A more acidic environment uh, enhances aggregation and uh, also the fast quenching component of NPQ. I'd like to uh, give acknowledgement to all the persons and parties involved with the research presented in this talk, especially to my supervisor, Prof. Chart Krier, and uh, Bertus van Heerden, Joshua Boeta, and Dr. Guizdala, who were of immense help. Uh, thanks also to all my colleagues at the University of Pretoria and the NRF uh, for funding the research. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Uh, thanks for your talk. It's very interesting. Um, are there any questions for the thank speaker? You. Trevor, I see your hand up. I'm just turning on my video. Um, hi, Francois. Thank you for a very good talk. Hi interesting and I, I, I many things went through my mind when you were when you were uh, talking um the one the one thing that that was interesting to me is how did you make your protein oh uh the allergy two yes uh, protein yes that was um isolated by um uh, dr Chris Dalla from the um from spinach leaves um using uh well ultra centrifugation 
Um, and then, uh, yes, the LHC2 was uh, stored in a um, minus 80 degrees uh, Celsius uh, freezer. Um, so yes, that uh, I, I I did not prepare the uh, protein myself. Um, yes. Okay, so, uh, so how much characterization did you do of that material that, that gave you confidence that the material was was good? Um, I well, yeah I did um, fluorimetry measurements um, to some extent, and um, well I also did uh, some lifetime measurements uh, to measure um, the fluorescence lifetime of the samples before any uh, detergent removal. Um, yeah, if if the lifetimes are much shorter than four nanoseconds, then um, one could say the uh, sample isn't very um, very good. But yeah, the, the lifetimes were all close to four nanoseconds, um, indicating that um, the, uh, denaturing um, and quenching uh, was um, minimalized before detergent removal. Um, Yes, so yeah, that's it's mostly mostly what I did. Yes. Okay, thank you. That's that answers my question. But Trevor, if I could just add to that, right. so after the isolation and purification of LHG two, we we took an absorption spectrum, and that spectrum matched perfectly that of the spectrum in the publication that we followed for the isolation. Okay. okay. Oh yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, uh, the other thing that occurred to me is that that your aggregates that formed, it might be uh, yes. to look at them in in the electron microscope to see what in what in fact you were dealing with, or do you think you're just dealing with a with a mess? Yes, yes. That that would be uh, also good. Um, but yes, uh, I think um, if the aggregates are um, too large, then they are not uh, natural. So um, yeah, it's maybe with the electron microscope, um, one would only see a difference if, if it's already um, unnatural um, aggregates. Um, Yes, so I, I also did some confocal microscopy, um, but yes, the the aggregates were all um, the same size on on the Rasa scan, since they are all smaller than the um, the focus of the laser. Um, but yes, yes, that's that's a good uh, a suggestion. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Francois. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Are there are another speaker uh, questions for the speaker, and we're sort of getting uh, well, we're at the time. So let's just thank the speaker. We can give him a clap and a thumbs up. Throw some flowers for a heart. Well, thank you again. So our uh, thank you. Next speaker for this session is Kim Bottom, who I see is here. Um, let's see. Yep, I'm here. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. You can uh, let's see if uh, Francois, you can stop sharing your screen, and Kim can come up. Uh, okay. Yes, it's uh, there. Um. Yep. Okay. There you go. And Kim, you can. Yeah, do you see my talk? screen now? Yep, I can see your, your screen and you yeah. can go to presentation mode and begin. There you go. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk today and thank you for organizing this uh, amazing conference. Um, my name is uh, Kim. I'll just move to a slide where you can see my name. Um, so I'm a senior research scientist at a company called Sofion. 
we are located uh, with headquarters in Denmark, where I'm sitting, and uh, we are developing uh, high throughput uh, patch clamp systems. And uh, the story I uh, brought today is how we develop a high throughput electrophysiological screen. And here we evaluated a uh, snake neurotoxins. And we could also um, evaluate the neutralization potential of uh, recombinant, recomb recombinant antibodies. Um, and this was a collaboration with the Danish Technical University, a tropical pharmacology lab, and then the antibody company IONTAS. And um, the tropical pharmacology lab and IONTAS developed uh, the antibodies, and we've then been in charge of setting up um, a functional assay. Uh, this has been published, or at least some of the data I'll show today have been published earlier this year, um, just to show you that you can also find it again uh, later. But, uh, but why? Uh, looking at the um, snake bite in venom, and that's because it's a, uh, it's a neglected disease. It's um, happening more than 3 million times a year, and there's worldwide more than uh, hundreds of thousands of deaths. And the, the people that survive will still uh, suffer from um, uh, severe injuries, and uh, many must uh, amputate uh, limbs after being bitten by a snake. Currently, uh, the only available treatment is uh, animal-derived serum. And uh, I'll come back to that uh, later. But, uh, but why are we looking at uh, a snake toxins? So when a, a snake is uh, biting its prey, then uh, the toxin is injected and there are several components um, to the venom. So uh, it's a mixture of different toxins where the the fastest acting are the neuro neurotoxins. So that's the ones we've been focusing on. These toxins are paralyzing the, the prey. So they will lay still when they, they're being eaten by the snake. Um, to look into how these neurotoxins works. Um, so here's a figure of a, a neuron. And you have to imagine that the, the action potential is propagating through the axon of the, this neuron and is then uh, transferred to the, the muscle, muscle through the, a, a new muscular junction. And if we zoom in on this junction, then you can see the nerve terminal here, and then you have the junction here with the myocyte on the other side. And the action potential is uh, transferred using, um, in this case, acetylcholine, and uh, this is released by the dendrite and will then activate these acetylcholine receptors sitting on the other side of the, of the cleft, and thereby uh, ions will float into the cell, depolarizing the membrane and start an action potential, and later on a contraction of, uh, of this muscle. And if this is blocked, here uh, are some toxins. If they then block these uh, ion channels, then the cell will not be depolarized and the prey will be paralyzed. To study ion channels, um, you can use, um, or the preferred technique is patch clamp, where I have a small picture here in the corner where a micro pipette is uh, attached to the cell and then you can break the membrane and thereby create electrical contact to the cell interior. And then the current running over the cell membrane will then be recorded. Um, this technique has been developed by Neher and Sackman and they received the Nobel Prize in Medicine for it. Uh, and to record this, you need uh, this setup. So even though you have a micro pipette sitting here under the microscope, you need a, a, a huge um, equipment to do so. To make this uh, both uh, smaller and more uh, automized, you can, instead of inserting a micro pipette, then if you have cells in suspension, they can be put onto uh, the patch hole. So this is called planar, planar patch because the hole is in a glass surface. And then you can break through the cell membrane and thereby record uh, the electrical currents from the cell. And by doing so, then you can automate the process. Here are two of our systems where you have a, a, a robot 
in charge of the pipetting, and then you can record several cells at the at the same time in an automated manner. If you zoom in on a one recording site, um, you should imagine this is a flow channel with around two micro uh, liter of a liquid. So the cell is, uh, yeah, cartoonic and therefore enlarged. Oh, sorry. Um, and in the surface of the cell, you see ion channels. This is an in our study, acetylcholine receptors, and current can run through these. Because there's hole in the cell membrane, then all the current that are running through these uh, ion channels can then be recorded by two electrodes. So we are in control of the current and on the voltage, and therefore we have an idea on when they are open and when they are closed. And, um, and because this is done in a uh, planar fashion, so instead of having this huge setup, you can either have this uh, small semi-automated system. So imagine it's the size of a, uh, yeah, it's half a meter wide. So it can fit on the, on the lab bench, and then you can record eight cells uh, simultaneously. Then you can, uh, we also have a system yeah, with a pipetting robot attached to it. Um, and now in an automated manner, you can patch um, 84 cells at uh, the same time. And then if you move to the biggest model, then uh, you can patch 384 cells at the same time automated. And this allowed for, for larger screens um, and to be a little bit um, corporate, you can say. So here you have the manual patch uh, set up, which I use for my PhD, and there you can record approximately 20 data points a day. But with uh, the semi automated system that is increased to more than 100 points a day, but then putting on a robot, you are in thousands data points a day. And then with the large uh, high throughput screen systems, then you can record up to 16,000 cells a day. So that is speeding up um, the process process uh, dramatically. So, but um, returning to this, uh, this study, and now you know where I am from and, uh, and what we do, then um, we want to use electrophysiology to, um, to evaluate both uh, the snake neurotoxins, um, but also to see if it's possible to develop an uh, antidote to neutralize these toxins using, uh, using antibodies. And, uh, and the current treatment, uh, the traditional antivenom, there you inject snake toxins. So you milk uh, the toxin, uh, the venom out of a snake. And, uh, and then you inject it into horses. And then you harvest uh, blood from these horses. From, from this blood, you can then purify the antibodies. Um, and this antibody mixture is then formulated and is then used to inject into the poor victim that has been bitten by a snake. Um, and this process is um, expensive, but it's also um, it's difficult to reproduce and um, it's also having some um, immunogenic responses because the origin is from, from horse. So the idea by, behind this study is to see if uh, this can be um, if we can do this in a recombinant manner. So uh, so by producing antibodies that are ex expressed in a recombinant system as a, as Cho cells, and thereby both being control of uh, the antibody generation and also uh, the expression make it more pure having a human background then make a recombinant answer venom uh, to replace the horse uh, produced one and again looking at uh, what are the idea behind this is that when you look at the uh, neuromuscular junction um, then we we'll both like to see if we can evaluate the toxicity of um, of the the toxins, the neurotoxins, but also see if we can uh, rescue the receptors and neutralize these toxins uh, using antibodies. And to do so, we used a uh, automated uh, patch time system and a um, immortal cell line, 
And this emotional cell line is expressing the acetylcholine receptors. And the, the setup we used is then to, uh, to patch these cells so that we are in voltage control. And then we can look at the response generated by acetylcholine, so the, the current that is then conducted. And then first evaluating uh, the toxins and then later on uh, the neutralizing effect of the antibodies. In real life, it looks like this. So first evaluating uh, acetylcholine, you see this is the response. Um, when acetylcholine is this, um, exposed to the cell here, and you can see that the cell uh, current is elected in the cell, and this current is increasing with increasing concentrations of acetylcholine. And if you plot this, you get a dose response curve. So with increasing concentrations, you get a increasing response. And then we selected a value where you have 80% of uh, the acetylcholine response and use this concentration then to evaluate uh, evaluating the toxin. So now the toxin comes on top of the acetylcholine response. So when there's no, no toxin, you can see acetylcholine is electing this current here. But with increasing concentration of toxin, this response gets smaller and smaller. And again, we can make a dose response curve. Using this curve, we then selected a concentration of the toxin. Um, in this case, we used alpha cobra toxin. So this is a, a neurotoxin from the, the cobra. And used a concentration that could inhibit 80% of the current. So now we're having a sandwich with current being um, elected by acetylcholine, but then blocked by the alpha neurotoxin. Um, again, then on top of this, we pre-incubated the toxin with um, recombinant antibodies that are raised against this neurotoxin. And, um, and what you can see here in the first graph is the response to acetylcholine. And then when you add toxin and a low concentration of antibody, this response uh, will be inhibited. However, if you then increase the concentration of the antibody, then you can see that you can actually um, preserve uh, the acetylcholine response. And then hopefully yeah, you won't see this uh, paraly uh, paralyzing effect uh, of the toxin. This was um, developed not only to see whether it was possible to neutralize these, uh, these toxins, but also to see if we could uh, improve the neutralizing effect. So, uh, so by plotting the dose response of, so here we have antibody concentration, so a higher concentration of antibody than a larger fraction of the acetylcholine receptor response will be restored. Um, and the more left shifted curves, they, they are, the antibodies are having a more um, neutralizing effect. So this is a way to evaluate the antibodies. So which of them are um, having the largest neutralizing effect. So this was uh, the first success. It was possible to neutralize the toxins, but also that we couldn't evaluate what is the most, um, which have the most neutralizing potential of these antibodies. But as I said in the beginning, um, a snake venom, it consists of several different uh, toxins. Um, for example, the cobra, there are several, uh, both short and long forms of uh, alpha cobra toxin, but they, besides that, there are also more toxins in the, in the venom. Uh, and instead of develop a single antibodies against each type, uh, the aim was then to see if we could make a, a consensus toxin because many of these uh, toxins are um, evolutionarily uh, preserved. So looking at, um, at the sequence, you can see that some of the sites are more preserved than others. And then by making a, a consensus toxin, so this is not a, 
uh, been a toxin harvest from a snake, but um, in lab generated toxin that are representing so, uh, 20 different short neurotoxins were generated and then antibodies were raised against this consensus toxin. And the hope was that then one toxin could neutralize several, oh, sorry, this antibody could neutralize several toxins. Uh, now we needed a higher throughput, so we shifted from uh, the small robot to the larger system here, where we can record from uh, 384 cells at the same time. And to show you what this looks like, again, uh, the acetylcholine response you can see here. So when acetylcholine is uh, added, you see a, a current from the cell, and then when it's, a, um, when it's washed out, the signal disappears. And by doing this with the increasing concentration, then again, you get a dose response. And here you can see a plate view where we are patching 384 uh, cells at the same in parallel. And then you can get dose responses from, from each cell. Then on top of this, uh, we were adding um, both the toxins and, um, and the antibodies. And then if you imagine that this plate view, then we are evaluating uh, eight Oh, sorry, uh, six different toxins. They are here in columns four by four. Uh, they are uh, from four different snake species. So six toxins, but four species. And then against that, we are testing 15 different antibodies. And, um, and from the first column here, you see that all the antibodies, so red means that uh, they have a high neutralizing effect. So there is no block, uh, the toxin is having no effect. So they're being neutralized by, uh, by the antibodies and all the antibodies showed an effect on this first uh, Mamba toxin here. But then when you look at the other toxins, then for example, the one you have in this row here, it was only effective against this toxin and not against the other ones. But if you just go Below here, these two antibodies showed effects on several different toxins, also across species. And again, uh, down here, I think even I, uh, I have some arrows for that. Uh, again, here, uh, these oh, sorry, these antibodies here also showed an effect on uh, alpha cobalt toxin, but also a minor effect. They're a little bit lighter blue, these ones here, on two other um, toxins. So this demonstrates it's actually possible to make antibodies that are recognizing and neutralizing several different toxins. And then um, to the last part of the study um, to see if they actually worked in vivo as well. So uh, the setup here is that different uh, toxins have been injected into, uh, into mice. And um, and these are survival uh, curves. And it might be difficult to see from this because it's either zero or 100, but the toxin alone, then all the mice died within yeah, less than an hour. Um, and then when the toxin was co uh, or pre incubated with the antibody, then the mice survived and the, you didn't see any uh, mortality. In this, uh, in the group that was uh, co-injected with the antivenom. So this is from for one toxin. Then across the toxins, you can see that there was still a protective effect um, from against other toxins. Yeah, again, proving that not only could we see a, in a cellular assay, but also in vivo, we could see a, a, a neutralizing effect of these uh, recombinant antibodies. So here, to, uh, to sum up, um, we showed that uh, indeed it was possible to engineer human IgGs that could uh, neutralize uh, venom-derived uh, neurotoxins. Um, and also it was possible to uh, distinguish uh, the potency of uh, these different antibodies using automated pest clamp and thereby uh, select the more uh, potent antibodies. And also it was possible both to generate and to assay uh, broader neutralizing um, antibodies. And we could uh, detect uh, 
the capacity using a automated patch clamp. And then here in the end, because I'm from the company, I also need to say that both the QPATS and the CUBE are well suited to, uh, to characterize both the peptide toxins, but also to evaluate the, the antibody function. With, uh, with this, I will end my presentation and then I, uh, I hope there'll be some questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> very interesting talk, a very important topic. Uh, Thank you. Are there any questions for the speaker? Trevor? Yes. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Kim, for coming and presenting this work at our conference. It's really fascinating, both the technology and the science that you've presented. So, so thank you for that. I have two questions. Um, the first is, uh, do you also have machines with single protein sensitivity or at least machines that can enable measurements across single membranes or on, on protein monolayers? And the second question is, considering the very limited amount of research funding in Africa, do you also offer opportunity to um, enable the use of some of your machines on your own premises? Yeah, uh, thank you for these questions. Uh, to reply to the first one, um, as it is of today, we only have uh, patch clamp systems. Uh, so that means you have to have uh, your proteins or ion channels expressed in a cell. Uh, so we don't have monolayer uh, technologies. Um, and then when you have entire cell, then uh, you can do some uh, single channel recordings. So that will be um, the closest you get to, to single protein interaction. But if you want to have one single protein interact with one single ion channel, then you need to go to a different technique. There, um, the, the current will be so small that the amplifiers cannot catch uh, this current. So we are measuring in, the, in pico amperes, um, and we cannot go below five pico amps. Um, and this is uh, around the threshold for, for one ion channel. And secondly, it was also a really good uh, question whether we uh, allow access to our instruments. Uh, yeah, we do. We have a research grant. Um, we have two grants, either a, a travel grant, if you want to uh, show data at a conference or attend a conference, then we have a travel grant um, that will um, help with uh, traveling cost. And then we have a, a research grant where you can apply for a stay here in, uh, in Denmark, for example, but we also have uh, Sofian Labs in uh, Tokyo, Japan, and in uh, Boston, US, and also in uh, Shanghai, China, where you can come and uh, with the help of, uh, of our scientists to, to um, yeah, measure your, your own biology and uh, get your own data for, for publications. If you want to know more about that, then I can uh, say that we have a webpage, sofion.com, and there you can also find the travel grants. And if not, then you can also just write me and then I will help you find them. Excellent. Yeah, thank you very much, Kim. Very nice. valuable information. Trevor, you had your hand up. Yes, I, I wanted to go back to your slide where you demonstrated the efficacy of your antibodies, please. Yeah, um, let me see. That one, yes. Oh, here, uh, this one? Yeah, yes, that one. Yeah. So, so the, is NM8 is the, is the uh, um, name of the, of the most efficacious antibody, is it? No, sorry, uh, we have toxins made, up here. And then you have the antibodies down here. Oh, I see. Okay. So, yeah. so the NM8 toxin yeah. is, is neutralized by almost all the antibodies that you made. Yeah. Whereas the, the DP4 toxin yeah. is, is only neutralized by IgG03. Yeah. And yeah. also to some extent two. So, um, yeah, the yellow color indicates that it's, um, has a lesser neutralizing potency, but it is neutralizing. So a higher concentration would also um, give a better neutralization. 
So what we look at is uh, mostly the molar ratio. So in the perfect world, then the antibody will bind two uh, toxic molecules. So a ratio uh, one to two, then one yeah antibody can then bind the two uh, toxins. But then when they have a lower neutralizing uh, potency, then you need to go into a higher concentration to uh, to get the same neutralizing effect. Okay, so so if you were bitten by a snake, yeah, you would have to choose the the, the, the correct antibodies. If you if you were bitten by a snake that had alpha elapitoxin on it, yeah, you would be in in you would be in a bad shape. As it is for now, these are not um, um, clinically available. So this is uh, basic studies. So this was mostly to demonstrate it's possible to make antibodies that with cross reactivity. But you're completely right. It's about to, um, in the end, there should be a antibody cocktail. And um, as cost is an issue, then the less antibodies you put into this cocktail, the cheaper it will be to produce. So uh, for example, if you choose to use IgG3, then you might spike that antibody cocktail also with one of the, from the Q series down here, so that you have a broader uh, protective effect. Okay, now how does these, how do these efficacies compare to the horse serum um, stuff that is on the market? Um, the efficacies are, are higher, uh, but they are monoclonal, whereas the horses are uh, polyclonal. Um, so for now, it's also too difficult to make antibodies against all the components. So uh, the first step will be to spike simply the horse um, antivenoms with some of these antibodies here, because the horse is also not developing antibodies against all the toxins in the snake venom. Um, so the less uh, antigenic, anti, uh, sorry, the less antigenic uh, toxins can then be picked out, and then you can make monoclonal antibodies against that and spike the horse serum. I think that will be a first step, and then down the line you will then maybe be, be able to make a mixture. So uh, with the monoclonal. Okay. So last question. Yeah. I understand that the that the horse serum is extremely unstable and has a very limited shelf life. Would this be true of synthetic antibodies? Um, you are more in control of the, um, of the formulation. Oh, but I, it's a little bit out of my comfort zone, but I think you can make it a little bit more stable, but the horse serum is also not that unstable. You can still have it in your car if you go into the bush, for example. So it doesn't have to be frozen. Antibodies are actually super stable molecules. Um, so it doesn't have to be refrigerated all the time. Uh, and that's actually the idea is that some a protective um, um, aid you can have in your car, for example. So if you get bitten, then you can take this. Um, but then on top of this, I can also tell you a little bit of what is going on because um, antibodies are stable, but uh, nanobodies are more stable and you can work a lot around stability of these uh, molecules and by making them monoclonal and also uh, by producing them in the lab, you can also design more stable uh, molecules in that way. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That answers all my questions. Thank you. Are there more questions? Yeah, I, I do have one question. So um, how much would one of your experimental rigs cost for a, a university to acquire? I'm sorry, I don't know that. Um, I try to stay in the science department, so uh, I cannot yeah. give you an answer uh, answer to that. Sorry. And uh, when you're doing the measurements, uh, what type of uh, measures are taken for the noise su su um, suppression? The so suppression that you're getting your signal. Yeah, um, so I can, if I go back, uh, I think maybe you're referring to that here with the uh, manual patch clamp. You see yep. there, there's, a, there's a Faraday cage around to, uh, to isolate from, uh, mm -hmm. from noise in the room. Uh, and then 
one thing if um, with grounding you can avoid that noise so by being in control uh, of the system and all the noise then uh, by grounding we don't see that much noise mm -hmm. uh, but then we also in uh, in some of the system have a a metal case surrounding the plate the recording plate place in here in the middle um, so that is also to some extent uh, shielding from from noise mm -hmm. but mostly because we are producing all the con component we also uh, capable of gro probably grounding all the components and therefore we don't see that much noise gotcha okay yeah <laughs> does that i mean does the molecule itself have some noise right does that or is the level at which the noise occurs um, yeah, of course, uh, yeah, there, yeah. there might be some 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 state. Uh, what do you call that? Uh, some background, uh, so yeah. unstimulated opening of uh, these ion channels. Uh, but that will be constant, um, and therefore, um, so when you measure, if I go to a measurement here, uh, in the beginning you see a constant level here. Yeah. Um, and then when you put on um, acetylcholine and the receptors opening. Then the the noise signal to noise ratio is so small that uh, it's not an issue. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for presenting at this conference uh, uh, yeah. to you and your company for for uh, thinking of us and presenting here. I I, I wanted to make sure you know there, there's a such thing called the there's a society of uh, uh, society of neuroscientists of Africa something like that SONA. Yeah. I don't know if you knew about that organization, but it's uh, one of our partner organizations. So I think what we'll try to do uh, is uh, follow up and uh, put you in touch with them. With that that would be great. That would be great. Thank you. We can you. Uh, have a patch clamp camp of some sort. Yeah, that would be cool. Thank um, you much, very much for that and for uh, giving me the chance to talk here today. It's been a pleasure. Okay. <clears throat> All right, well, thank you. If there's no yes, other uh, questions for the speaker. No, Lawrence, there's yes. another question in the chat. From where? And uh, it's a question in the chat. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, please, da, 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 da. are you are you able to explain why the antibodies are effective to perhaps enable the use of simulation in designing MOFD effective? What is MOFD? Uh, effective antibodies by computation. Okay, right. Um, so what's the what's the uh, I guess what's the host guest interaction? Um, sorry, say that again. I didn't catch the last so, part. So I guess the question is, yeah. what is the uh, the molecular mechanism of neutralization? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I think I can um, at least I can I can try to to answer that question because there was also some com uh, computation in it and. Um, so there's there are really good models of um, of antibodies against this is a little bit outside of my uh, scientific comfort zone but uh, they're super good models and I think we'll see way more uh, computation in the future and we uh, also as I said earlier um, you can develop not only on the interaction but also on the stability and also the survival of the antibodies inside uh, inside the body and yeah. their computational models are super strong um, and a lot of things are happening in that field and uh, yeah we also have projects on that well i think you know what is possible um because you have uh, you're already making proteins and yeah. you seem to be making them at, at quantity is if we could somehow um get the purified antibody I guess receptor uh, uh, complexes, and then do structural biology on them. Because yeah. ideally, you would like to get to a point where you don't need the entire IgG molecule; you just need uh, a piece that can be solidified and be a therapeutic, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, there are some uh, some super strong um, de novo design platforms. Yeah. So instead of starting with the antibody complex, and again. Sorry, this is outside uh, of uh, my core knowledge, but there are some super strong platforms uh, and I can see that people are actually using them to design uh, instead of using fate to play, then they will use these uh, these platforms where they uh, yeah model the interaction and then use 
use these binders and then start to assay them. But you do need to have a functional assay because yeah. one thing is, is there a binding between uh, the peptides and the ion channel, but does it actually block the ion channel or open the ion channel? That For that, you need um, a functional assay in the end. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks again. And uh, like I said, we'll, we will follow up because I think it's, yeah. uh, we do need uh, some patch clamp camping. Yeah, <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we can do that in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Uh, so let's give the speaker a some clapping and thumbs up. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And flowers and hearts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that concludes, I think, this session. We take a how many minute break? Uh, a 20 minute break. Then we... 20 minute break. Reconvene and then, on uh, we come back for uh, molecular biophysics. Molecular biophysics talks. So look, look, yeah, twenty minutes, and uh, we'll come back here. All right, thank Hi. you. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye. Right. Bill, I'm gonna stop the recording for a little bit. Stop! 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 <clears throat> so Trevor, are you already in uh are you already in George?